fact, the Bible, there's, no, there's an, old, an old preacher by the name of Jonathan Owen, and he used to say this, murder sin lest it murder you. Because sin is an apex predator that's out to destroy everyone else. It's out to destroy the world in which we live. And, and so the Bible says to actually be serious about it. In fact, Paul said it this way, put off sin. Put on God's righteousness. And so just like you would change your clothes, God's saying, you've got to be serious about this because it's not just that sin is something that affects my relationship with Jesus. Sin affects the world in which we live. And now things, it's like the middle school band, things are not as they're meant to be. Now, I, I realize if I ended right now, that would be incredibly depressing. <laughs> like, man, that's really serious. You know, this guy came from America and told us we're all sinners. And, you know. But that's not where the story ends, is it? Because where the story goes next is the story of, I'm, I'm going to combine redemption and restoration just for the sake of time. But it says in Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15, So God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. My wife said, Amen. She does not like snakes, by the way. My wife doesn't like snakes. And, and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust and all the, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, once again, notice, God cursed the ground. He separated humanity. But this is the first mention of redemption taking place in the Bible. God decisively acts to throw the power of the enemy. And he puts in place a plan of redemption. And you see this uh, throughout, we're going to talk about this in the next session a little bit, but God puts in place a godly line through which his son would be born and would change the trajectory of the world and where it was going. You see it in Abraham, right? And then the children of Israel. Um, and, and sometimes we read the Old Testament, we go, that's the law. You should read the Old Testament, and one of the takeaways you should get from the Old Testament is, man, none of us can obey God. Like the Israelites constantly were, God gave them, but they constantly were good, right? But the second thing that you should take away, and especially one of the major stories in the Old Testament, is the children of Israel who were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and God delivered them and set them free. And the Old Testament's constantly pointing us to Jesus. And it's pointing us not to ourselves, it's pointing us to Jesus, who was the one who would eventually set us free, right? And give us freedom from sin. And give us the opportunity to live from a place of victory, not trying to strive for victory. We live from a place of victory. And so, so um, what we recognize is that God's redemptive plan was enacted, and all of it points to Jesus. But my point is that it didn't just point to Jesus to forgive you and I of our sin, so that we could have right relationship and then someday make it to heaven. It pointed to the fact that Jesus was a king installed and was establishing now his kingdom here on earth. Amen. Now, what's interesting is that the work on the cross didn't just deal with forgiveness. The work on the cross took the authority that the enemy had stolen from you and I, yeah. took it back, and God redistributes and gives it to us. Amen. And so we don't run around right now going, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to conquer everybody and all that. No, no, no. We follow the example of Jesus. We lay down our lives. And it's this upside down, inside out, backward kingdom where we, it's so counter culture. Mm -hmm. The way you and I now live out our lives, we follow the example of Jesus laying down our lives so that the kingdom of God might be established here on earth. Yeah. In fact, look at Colossians chapter 1. It says this For God has, was pleased to have all the fullness dwell within him, and through him he reconciled to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven making peace through his blood. So everything was made by and for Jesus, everything holds together in Jesus, and everything will be reconciled by Jesus Christ. And so this is what God has called us to. Now the question, I'm going to move quickly now, um, because I really don't want to buy you lunch. Um, not because I don't love you, okay, honestly. Um, but how then do we live this out? And this is where you and I have the opportunity. Uh, and I want to show you a little chart. Um, that will kind of help us understand, well, how do we, you and I, live out this thing? If this is all true, uh, how do we live this thing out? Go ahead, and, there we go. And so there's there's kind of a couple of options, aren't there? And, and maybe, I see this in America, maybe this doesn't happen here, but you can, you can choose separatism, right? Which is that don't mingle with the big bad world, right? 
Ooh, that's icky out there. Do you guys use the word icky? No, you don't use that word icky. Okay, some of you don't have that. Okay. It's like, ooh, that's that. You know, we don't, well, we don't hang out with the world because that's bad, right? And oftentimes, it, you know, we, we fear it. Uh, it's self-preservation, uh, right? There's, that's how we live. Now, we can live that way as the church, or we can go over to the other side, and we could live with what, what would be called the word syncretism. Which is, we're just going to blend in, we're just going to vanish into the current culture. We end up compromising. And oftentimes, you know, you know, cool Christians try to live that way, right? Because we're trying to relate to culture. And so we, we kind of live that way, you know, and we, we kind of just kind of blend into culture. And I think there's a third option. And I think God's design is that you and I would be a creative minority. Creative minority is a community of believers who live out God's story. What's God's story? Well, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Yeah. It started with purpose and glory and these things that God was calling us to create here on earth, right? And yes, we realize that it was subverted by the enemy. We realize that Jesus comes to redeem you and I as family members, as children, but not just to leave us there, but to include us in his original purpose, to see the kingdom of God established. That's the story we live out. Well, how do we do that? We do it the way Jesus showed us. There's a lot of Christians that I've met that, man, they're just going to take it to the world. You know, you're wrong and all this kind of stuff. But they're not doing it the way Jesus did. Jesus laid down his life. Jesus exemplified the love of Jesus. Now, Jesus also didn't compromise. Jesus had his convictions that he lived out. Those things anchored him. Right? But you have to ask yourself, isn't it interesting that children love to hang out with Jesus? Sinners love to hang out with Jesus? Prostitutes love to hang out with Jesus? Like, there was something about Jesus that drew people to him. But without compromise. And I think this is what God has called us to be. God has called our churches to be, I think, a truly, the truly alternative way of living life. And you see this throughout the Bible. How many of you remember the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament? Right? And we raised our kids this way. We said, hey, you live in Babylon? Don't be surprised that that's what Babylon does. But we live this way. But we live in a way that's redemptive. We participate redemptively in culture. And we show the true way, the true story, the real way of living out how Jesus called us. So let me, let me, I'm going to close with this. We'll throw up the last diagram. So what does that mean for us? Well, for us, I believe that the church is God's family that is establishing his kingdom here on earth, which means that we should be the ones that are helping to shape culture. Some of you have uh, amazing jobs that uh, have great influence, not just here in Liberty, but around the world. And God has placed you here to make a difference. Now, oftentimes what happens in the church world, go to the next slide, is that we try to, you know, hey, we need somebody to play bass, and we need a good band, and, you know, so we need somebody to run media, we need somebody to help us. So, so oftentimes what we do is we try to pull from the talents in those places, and then we use it kind of to help the nonprofit side of who we are as a church family. But I think what God's designed us for is the next slide. I think this is what God's designed. That if we truly understand God's story, then we understand that God has created us to be a part of his story. To live for his glory. To see the kingdom of God. To see that, that word about um, being fruitful is to create culture. And so you create culture in this room by how you interact with each other. But you know you create culture at work by how you interact with your coworkers. You create culture by how you interact with your friends and your neighbors. The people that you go to the gym with or play on a sports team with, right? God's brought you here to help create something of the kingdom of God here in Limerick, and I'm going to tell you this tomorrow, and around the world. We have a little phrase in America, we say this, you, pump, you, you guys punch above your weight, you know what I mean when I say that? You know, it's like I'm a boxer, and, I'm, and man, you guys are having an impact, and I believe prophetically there's a greater impact that God's calling you to yeah. as you live out God's story. Amen? Amen. All right. I know that was a lot. Do you forgive me? Okay. Uh,
Um, all right, so we want to take a look right